coming to you from the M&M Exterior Studio in Nooksville, Virginia, this is Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle, the introvert's extrovert. She talks to people so you don't have to. For now. All right, welcome back to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle, the introvert's extrovert. I'm here with Tom Bogoski. Welcome, Tom. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> Good Happy morning. Valentine's Day. Happy were you allowed Valentine's to say Valentine's weekend. Day? Yeah, this okay. won't air until after Valentine's Day, but right. I think it's important for the listeners Good. to just really jump into the conversation with us and get a feel for this day. And so, happy Valentine's Day. I brought treats. <gasps> you did? I did. Good thing I gave you a treat. Oh. Now, Amanda gave that to me. My wife gave that to oh, me this morning, but thank you. far too many, you, uh, Amanda, far too many sweets Reese's. in our house. Reese's. And she got me these chocolate golf balls. Oh, I love chocolate balls. So we'll try balls. those later. Ooh. It's made by a woman-owned company. Read that on the back. Oh, a woman-owned, certified yeah. woman-owned, veteran-owned, made with wind energy. God, they're, they're hitting everything. All Very the key nice. points. I know. <laughs> Veterans, women. <laughs> energy efficient. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> Gluten-free, Gluten non-GMO. Free. Yes, this is amazing. Good God. Um, but we got far too much candy this morning was given out. Well, thank you for um, re-gifting your candy for it's me. It's my pleasure. Well, yeah. we'll all share it. Oh, we I each get on one sharing. ball? Yeah. Okay. I did so not bring the my favorite candy that I got, which is, the you talk about how to pronounce stuff, is uh, the Ferrero Rochers. Oh, yes. <sighs> Ferrero Rocher. So I, had, I don't know. I don't it know. was a heart-shaped one, so there was maybe eight or nine oh, in the heart. Yeah. And I think I had... Six or seven this of them morning already. already. Oh my goodness! Nice. Yeah, I'm not judging. That's that was that's breakfast. Awesome. Yeah, I but like they're that. delicious. Yeah, and they feel light. It's yeah. like the thin mints. Yeah. Oh, you eat like ten of them, you feel like you've had two cookies because yeah. they just melt in your mouth yeah. with hot coffee. That's amazing. Now, yeah, now I want another cup of coffee to have those balls. Nice, love but, a good ball. You would- <laughs> so, Tom, tell everybody who you are. The hardest question I will ask you: Who is Tom Bogoski? How am I supposed to answer that? Exactly. Right. How, what do you want to answer with that? I'm I'm a husband of, to Amanda and a father to Julia, who turns nine next week. Yes. Happy birthday, Julia. Aww. should say that early in the podcast because with their attention spans, when this airs, she'll yeah. probably listen for three minutes and yeah. want to go do something else. And then else. she'll so, hear her voice ha- and be like, oh, my gosh. Right. So happy birthday to Julia. And then Jacob, not to be outdone, will turn six in May. That's awesome. So I'm, I grew up in Philadelphia. And moved here in 2006, 13, 14 years ago. Yeah. That's so funny because I only lived in Philadelphia area as an adult for six, seven years. But what but, six, seven years? Uh, Early tw- 20s? Yeah, 22 yeah. to 29. We moved here. Like those I was are 29. Like formative years. Yeah. You know. But it seems funny. Well, I mean, I'm, like I'm finally it. probably after 14 years, I'm at that point where I feel like Virginia is my hometown. Yeah, now? Oh, hometown, yeah. really? Well, I mean, just, I don't know how you define hometown. Like, yeah. where hometown is yeah. where you're born, or, I mean, well, I hate see, to be one of these military I, brats. So, <laughs> I'm an army brat, so for me, yeah, I don't have a hometown, yeah. but it's funny, because Jersey, for me, because I live there for the high school and post-college years, that just mm-hmm. feels like, I feel like it's kind of where I grew up a little, and then it's kind of where I was first on my own, so it feels yeah. the most, that's maybe where I planted my single roots maybe and then of course virginia is now my like family roots so okay so tom you are a father a husband and a business owner correct it's true that is true yeah so i moved here in 2006 to be a man a sales manager for a company and then did that and actually couldn't stand that when we moved here i always remember i was certain that the job was going to be fine, Mm. but I was also certain I was going to get homesick and just miss Mm. the hometown. And, um, I mean, nothing, no offense to my family. (laughs) It's always, I'm going to say this and then my dad's going to listen to this and be like, you don't miss me. But we, I mean, I've grown, we love Northern Virginia, love the area. Um, but the job, the sales manager job just didn't work for me. So I, that company, uh, it's an insurance, I'm an insurance Mm -hmm. agent for a living. Um, the company I was working for was opening an office right down the street, right in Gainesville. So they opened that office and I decided I was going to go back and be a sales rep, mm-hmm. what I used to do back home. And uh, so I did that for about a year, year and a half, mm-hmm. I guess, 08, 09, most of that. Doing that and as I got 
kind of grew up and got more mature and started reading books and videos on sales and marketing yourself, yeah. the, I just started getting more ideas about how to market, how to sell, you know, how not the old, old world, old school ways of selling. Mm -hmm. um, Times were just, changing and you were yeah. wanting to keep up with it. Yeah. Just the, and what that company was wanting us to do just wasn't working for me. So mm -hmm. I started to get this itch and go off on my own where I could do things the way I wanted to do them. Not yeah. that they, I hated everything. I loved the job, but yeah. it just, there was stuff that I knew, I knew I kind of reached my limit. Yeah. There, I'd reached my level and my creativity and marketing and my entrepreneurial yeah. spirit yeah. was going to eventually be wasted. Just continuing there. There was no, I reached the ceiling at that point. Yeah. We knew each other pretty much Right, right. We were both married, um, but not ha didn't have kids yet. That's why we did right. so much networking. Um, and we're both building our businesses and whatnot. And so had a lot of stuff in common. And what I thought was really cool, too, is that we met. I remember the first time I met you, um, or like kind of was conscious of you as you were talking about making the switch to your new company or mm -hmm. starting your own thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, having someone even with Mary Kay, you know, I, I always explain to people that's it's your own business. You know, yeah, it's a company, but you have to hustle it as if, you know, it's your own business. Now, not every single thing, but a lot of it. And so I've always been intrigued by either entrepreneurs or I call them like hustlers in some way or another. And so I thought it would be fun for us to kind of dig into what made you make that change? What did you kind of learn from it? Because I feel like Everyone at some point in their life or some area of their life gets a point, like you said, where they hit that ceiling. So whether that means they're going to start a new job, look for a new job, um, start a business, or even just do something to, cause the way I've described this podcast is it's, um, it's like I had to do something with this creative energy. I didn't know what it was. Um, but I just had to do something. And I feel like the more you hear people's stories of doing that something, it doesn't have to be the same thing, but I think it just helps people kind of get the seeds planted in their own mind. Yeah. So, um, you know, so you are an entrepreneur, you're still in the insurance yeah. business. Yeah. So I remembered it, a lot of it happened in what well, happened in 09 was when I decided, but it going in the insurance business, there's two should not be an insurance podcast, but there's like, I know I was like, no kidding. I'm about to start snoring, we'll both all but say, you know, <laughs> there's a, like the captive agent that just works for a company. And then there's independent agents that go start their own business and do what they want and work with it, whatever companies will work with them. So I was going to do this back in 05 in Philadelphia uh -huh. and got like to round one of the process and then just kind of chickened out because I don't, I always remember this. I just thought, well, gosh, if the copier breaks down, <laughs> I got to go buy a new copier on my own and I'm working for this company. I just call corporate corporate does it. So that just weighed in the back of my mind. Like I always think the co the copier the is copier. my thing that if the copier breaks, I got to go, I got to call. So I got to find someone to fix the copier. Yeah. And it's so funny because now in 2020, I mean, I barely need a copier. Yeah. I mean, I definitely don't need a copier. Yeah. I barely need a printer because everything is electronic, electronic. now, but um, thank funny. God your podcast isn't sponsored by a printer company. I know. But, Ooh, sorry. Um, yes, but sorry, Canon. <laughs> right. Exactly. As I look at my $30 yeah. printer, we had to buy because ours broke and yeah. we use it like three times a year, but yeah. Yeah. But I started um, a lot of the marketing stuff because, see, it's funny. I was talking to other small business owners before this podcast, uh, some that are in insurance as well. And I just said, what what were the reasons you left? And they all kept saying freedom and mm -hmm. being able to control their hours. And the hours thing was good that I went on my own. But, I mean, the, I felt like I had a good amount of freedom working mm -hmm. as a sales agent for the company I was with before. Yeah. Uh, partially because I was in their top whatever percent, five, ten mm percent -hmm. of producers. So Humble they didn't brag. really mm -hmm. give me a <laughs> – Okay. That's hundreds of people. There were thousands of agents. I was not one of the I'm top. Joking. I wasn't even the top five I'm in Virginia. But and if you were, I would celebrate you. I was, I, I I was good enough. I was doing good enough. You're doing um, great. That I got, you know, freedom to, to leave if I needed to. But um, there was just, for me, it was marketing, mm. like self brand. Like it's funny, personal branding. I wrote down and that was such a big deal. There's a guy, sales author named Jeffrey Gittimer that wrote the little red book of selling to so go out entrepreneurs, anybody go Google his stuff. Um, Say it one more time. So in case people Jeffrey Gittimer, G I T O M E R. And uh, 
he wrote the Little Red Book of Selling, the Sales Bible, the mm -hmm. Little Black Book of Connections, uh, which was a great book to read that didn't help me overcome my fear of going to these chamber events. Yeah. But he would talk about that. And great. just the ideas I was picking up on how to brand, personally brand myself. So brand Tom Bogoski, mm -hmm. insurance agent, rather than big company logo with Tom Bogoski underneath yeah. of it. And um, so – and it's funny because I talked to other – people like the one of the gyms I used to go to one of the guys was leaving and I'd remembered it when I was talking about it I just said no matter where you go work whether it's at this large gym or that mm -hmm. large gym you've got to start marketing yourself mm -hmm. like you have to have an Instagram page especially in fitness yeah I mean I, I'm in insurance it's very hard mm -hmm. to be creative with insurance but fitness I said you have to have you can't be on the XYZ gym page doing stuff. You mm -hmm. need to get your own Instagram page and be mm -hmm. branding yourself, mm -hmm. either showing people how to do exercises because that you can carry on to the next company and the next job. And yeah. similar really to any industry that you're in yeah. is that brand yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, the litmus test I, that I came up with is if you're working, cause I don't, I haven't hired any salespeople in my office yet, yeah. but if I did, I am constantly reminding myself that I I can't I have to overcome this fear that if the, I let them be creative and brand themselves, mm -hmm. that they'll go, they'll leave me in three years. Mm -hmm. And that's such a big fear, especially yeah. in the insurance industry. And I'm sure a lot of other industries as well, mm -hmm. any sales industry mm -hmm. that, well, gosh, if I, I'm going to say copier salesman after I just yeah. ripped on copiers, yeah. but if Johnny, yeah. the copier salesman, if I let him brand it, if he leaves, he can take all that content with him. Mm -hmm. Well, I would argue to the business owner, the owner of the large business, that if your people, if your top producers are leaving, you're probably compensation isn't mm -hmm. set up the way, the yeah. way it necessarily should be. But I started getting that itch and the company I was working for, um, as great as they were, because yeah. I really think highly of where I worked, um, they didn't let me, I wanted to change my business card mm -hmm. and make it more creative. And they wouldn't let me do that. I wanted, I actually did. Create my only experience with iMovie mm -hmm. was making back in 09, making a customer testimonial video with six or seven customers talking about how much they liked me. And I would send it to prospects that were maybe on the fence or mm -hmm. weren't sure this and that. And this is before Google. I mean, now Google is yeah. great. I just email people. Oh, yeah. But people will reviews. ask, people will ask about like the insurance company that I'm writing that went and say, how good of a company? I said, well, you know. 80% of my customers are with this insurance company. So just go Google my agency and read my reviews. Mm -hmm. I said, if they're happy with me, they probably don't hate the insurance company they're with because I can't outdo a bad, I can't make up for bad service mm -hmm. from the company that I'm working with. So um, I, I made this YouTube video and the company that I was working for at the time as an employee like made me take it down. Mm -hmm. Somebody found out about it. I actually was a little sour on it because the person that made me take it down... I was, I knew him well enough mm -hmm. from corporate and he, rather than just email me or call me, he went down the lat chain of command mm. to the, this. So not only did I have to take it down, but he probably upset five managers down the line to get yeah. to me. Uh, so that was the final, that was about the final straw. Um, and right, right around that time, the small detail, mm -hmm. my mom died <laughs> August of 09. Small detail. Um, yeah. She died August of 09. I'm sorry. Uh, kind of yeah. expect she was sick for six years. So, yeah. um, but she died August of 09 and that was kind of that, you know, I don't remember thinking this exact thought, but we also didn't have children yet mm -hmm. and we were starting to think we were going to have children. Mm -hmm. So I kind of felt like I had a limited window mm -hmm. because when you, are a good producing person at a mm -hmm. in a sales job and you leave that company, you go from making good money to zero money. Yeah. So I knew we knew that my wife was going to probably stay home uh, when we had kids. So then her income would go from pretty decent down to zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, I knew I had a, a window. Mm -hmm. I had to do it. Mm -hmm. So that it, it was just, do I kind of jumped in. Do you feel like, is that the loss of your mom kind of just having that, Fragile fragility of life and kind of that emotional jolt give you the push. Yeah, it was the the YouTube thing, the business card idea. Mm -hmm. um, I might have even, in fact, I did at the time wanted to get it. That's when the Facebook fan pages. Mm -hmm. Remember, now you like a page, so yeah. people 
like flushing it out yeah. with Samantha Spittle on Facebook. Thank you. Thanks um, for that plug. But at the time, it was become a fan of. Yeah. And I wanted to make a fan page. I did. See, this yeah. is all coming to me. I wanted to make a fan page for Facebook for my agency and or for yeah. my for, for me you, as yeah. the employee of the company. And they wouldn't let me, which yeah. is funny because now all the agents at that company have pages, whether they want them or yeah. not. They set them up. Yeah. Um, but the employee is not able to add content to it. Yeah. So it's all this canned content from the insurance company, which doesn't yeah. get – it solicits zero response or zero likes yeah. or anything like that. But that's what's hard is because it's con- them controlling their brand. So they yeah. created their personal brand and it's kind of similar. If you create it, – it's you talked before about how do you let your salespeople – if or when you hire them, how much creativity control? Like, so your business cards, just to kind of loop everyone in, do, can we talk about your style? So yeah. your style, because I remember when it came out, was a baseball card because mm-hmm. you're a big baseball card collector. And so I thought in my head, oh, like, would you want to brand your agency slash team sports? Like, would you want all of your agents to have base, like a baseball card or a sports card of some kind? But if I worked for you, um, I don't know if the listeners know this, but I am not an athlete. Mm-hmm. So a sports card probably wouldn't be on brand for me. Right. So would I go in a different direction or would you want to keep it? You go in a different direction. And you would be cool with that because you're not bringing oh, I would, agency around. Yeah. It. As a business owner, I think I would want to approve it but or review yeah. it. But See, but, but it gets would, hard when you think of how big these companies are and then if everyone's running off doing their yeah. own thing, it's agreed. So, yeah, agreed. so hard. Well, which is why I said earlier I don't have any a lot of negative thoughts about yeah. the company I work with. I mean, they were yeah. great. They were great. When my mom died, they were phenomenal yeah. with taking That's time. Good. They The vice president who I mm-hmm. barely thought knew me, like there was flowers at the funeral oh, wow. from him yeah. and, the, and the management team at that company. My manager drove to Philadelphia wow. to come to the viewing. So I have good you thoughts know, about that. You but. know what I like about that, though? Because I love here. I'm glad to hear that they were so good because I always tell people, too, with Mary Kay, I had a great experience with it. I never – it's never negative. Like I'm leaning more into this now and some other fun yeah. things. Um, all good things. What I like focusing on and kind of asking you about some of that is because it kind of shows how it's about you. Like that you didn't leave the company because of something the company did. It was that there was something in you – that you needed to pursue. And just like, yeah. I feel like you grow up, you know, you hear of someone, if you don't like the way someone treats you, it's or something, it's like, yeah. it's not about them. It's about you or the, or, or no, I'm sorry. The way they're treating you is about, says more about them than you. Right. Yada, yada. It's kind of similar with like, Oh, this is universal in all of life yeah. that, you know, if you are feeling unhappy with your job situation, kind of take a look at yourself and say, it might not be the company. You might not be the best fit anymore. Yeah. Sometimes they'll do doing. you the biggest favor of your life. Yeah. By, by saying no to something. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, it's not like they were letting all the other employees do stuff and they just mm-hmm. decided to say no to me about yeah. doing stuff. But you got to the point where it was more important for you to kind of run with this creative energy, for lack of a better way to describe yeah. it. That's cool. I think that yeah. that's a neat thing to – that might get brushed over, you know, because yeah. people think – that's the thing. When you ask people, why did you start your own business? Money and freedom, time, usually seems to be – people think they yeah. can make more money or that they can control their schedules more. Those are kind of the two things yeah. I hear the most from talking to people. But it depends on the business you're in because I, I was kept thinking as these other – because I just texted mm-hmm. four insurance agents. Yeah. So I didn't really – wasn't yeah. a cross-section of the yeah. <laughs> population. But It's not an accurate. Uh, they all kept saying freedom, be able to make your own hours or something. And then I thought about like someone that's a like a manager at a restaurant or something mm-hmm. and they want to start their own restaurant. Well, goodness, oh your gosh. hours are – yeah, your yeah. hours are it, – it would get harder. Mm-hmm. And initially, that's another thing. When I started, I did work a lot of hours and I've just been able to scale it back a little bit. Not that I don't work, but it's great. Yeah. Like I was able to scale it back and mm-hmm. like we're, I'm home for dinner mostly every night. Yeah. Like I'm home to have dinner. The four of us eat dinner together. So, and we. And isn't that crazy though, that you're like proud of that, which I am, I'm not, I don't say this in a mocking way at all, right. that that's what's kind of sad with the state that we're in right now, like of the, and not just now, like for a long time that it's like that you are proud to have dinner most nights. It's like, Oh man, why aren't we doing that every night? And yeah, well, I mean, it's not a reality for everyone. So I want to like, well, you're right. And that's, and And I always stop because I, um, the, so the, my, my son's preschool, I, uh, that Julia used to go to, 
I would, I'm very, you know, I'm present there. I probably was more, I get guilty sometimes. I think I was more present when Julia. It's like that with your first, you're like exactly, more involved yeah. and then you're over yeah. it. And I'd remembered the, uh, some of the teacher, the, the woman that runs the school that you're, you're such a good dad. You're such a good dad. And I always was uncomfortable with that. Like you're the best dad ever. You're at all these events. And I was so uncomfortable with that because yeah. I, me being there doesn't make me a good dad because uh, we have a lot, all of us in this room have a lot of friends mm-hmm. that drive to the Pentagon yeah, every day. For sure. There's one friend of mine in particular drives to the Pentagon mm-hmm. every day and he's out of his house at 530 in the morning yep. to get on the bus or the yep. train or this and that. And then he's getting home at seven. Another friend yeah. comes to mind that lives down, works down near the Navy yard. Yeah. And it's like out at five. And one, he told me once, he said, that when the kids go to bed sometimes on Sunday night and I put them to bed, he's like, sometimes I don't see them again until Saturday morning yep. because he gets home at 830. So yeah. it doesn't make him a bad dad. Not at all. I'm sure no. if he could do the same job in Gainesville. Yeah. I mean, it's like you count your blessings and my, the, one of the mm-hmm. top two or three. One of the reasons that we love Northern Virginia so much mm-hmm. is the biggest problem with Northern Virginia that everyone complains about is commuting and traffic. And we have been sheltered from that. Mm-hmm. We don't, I've not, with kids, I've never had a commute in my yeah. life. It's like Gainesville Haymarket back and forth. Yeah. So, and Amanda stays home. Yeah. So a lot of that has allowed me to do that. Yeah. And I'm, you know, if I had to do a job in Washington, D.C. every day, I guess you do what you have to do to support your family. But yeah. a part of the other reason why I went on my own was that I knew I could do it locally. Yeah. And I, I, that was, that was important to me. Yep. It was a, it partially, I credit my parents, my dad for that. Um, my dad was always at stuff growing up and he mm-hmm. was, a, he was a pharmacist in a hospital local yeah. to our house. But the funny thing is we never, like we didn't go on these six vacations a year, uh-huh. but I think he just used his vacation time to do stuff with, uh, to mm. do like we go to the Philadelphia zoo. That was the big trip growing up. My dad was always a volunteer mm-hmm. and I don't look back and remember that it was like seven moms and my dad. I don't remember that. Mm-hmm. I just remember my dad was on the bus and he was, the cool dad on the bus, <laughs> he would like, we would look for stuff. We would play, you know, like the games you play when you're on the road yeah. that he was leading that. Hmm. And that, and I've kind of got, that's, you know, I get a lot of stuff from my dad, that's some sweet. good qualities, a <laughs> couple not so good qualities. Oh, let's sure. talk about those. No, no just God, no. <laughs> I'm joking. Cause he may listen to I this. I know. I would love for him to um, listen. He should be proud of but you. But the, yeah, any, any, uh, friendliness and social abilities that I get to connect with other people, I, probably got that from from him Mm -hmm. for the most part um but he was always there he didn't miss i don't remember him missing a lot games and practices and this and that and being he coached my was one of the like seven coaches on my first little league team and he didn't know baseball he would tell you this if he was here he learned baseball from me yeah he never watched a baseball game until i got into the phillies and that's what they say to do with your kids though is whatever they're passionate about you get passionate about so that you can connect with them so good job I've Mom's gotten dad. very passionate about Paw Patrol. Paw Patrol. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> and that was out of my memory. I haven't heard and, that one um, in a few years. Oh, gosh. Who's that girl that sells the head? Uh, Jojo, Jojo Siwa. Siwa. I've gotten very passionate about Jojo. Yeah, Jeremy doesn't know, but I know. I know. Yeah, I, um, I'm glad you brought that up, though, because that's why I just I love going back to everyone's journey is different. And, you know, you do what's best for you. Like for everyone, it's different and kind of not wanting to put someone else down for recognizing someone else, but, Mm. you know, kind of finding what works for you and, um, you know, leaning into that. So I think that's neat. So this personal branding, as we wrap up personal branding, what, so for people that might not know, or they're intrigued by what you're saying, how can you kind of give a quick overview? So you talked about wanting to make your own cards and things like that. What's the point of personal branding? Well, it tells people when people think, so when people think of Wegmans, talk mm-hmm. about Wegmans, mm-hmm. like what are the first two or three things that come to mind? Mm-hmm. And that's Weg. that, in my opinion, is Wegmans brand. Mm-hmm. And personal brand would be when people think of you. Mm-hmm. Now, there's people thinking of you as a person, but then like, what do people think of when they think of Tom, the insurance agent? Mm-hmm. And that's what your personal brand is. So I want people to, when they think of, Tom Bogoski, the insurance agent. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's my personal brand? Like, what are the two or three things that they think of when they think of me? So when... What are they for you? Oh, uh, what are they? Well, yeah. as an insurance agent, I think um, 
I, I always think of it like I, people will tell, they'll be talking about something and they'll say, well, Tom, you're, you're in sales. Mm. And I'm like, I don't feel like I'm in sales mm -hmm. because I feel to me, sales is like that dirty word mm -hmm. that means you're calling, you're talking to people and calling people that don't want to talk you. to you. Yeah. And that's part of the thing. I go back to things I don't miss about working for a company, what they made us do. It was these, these call nights, they would do call nights and it was working from five to eight or five to nine and calling people, people that you were trying to sell insurance to or whatever. And, um, just working past 5 p.m. and call. And nowadays I'm like, goodness, like if I talk about the copiers again, mm -hmm. if I, if I might possibly want to buy a copier, I, there's zero percent chance I'm going to buy a copier from that man or woman if they call me at 5 45 yes. at night. And that's what they had us doing. Yeah. And I have never done that since I went on my own. Yeah. And that's so, what goes back to the technology right. changing and with companies, if the, if there's, you know, they have procedures in place and things like that. They can't keep up with it yeah. necessarily as fast. So. Yeah. But go, what I think, I think, well, you could read my Google. That's what I always tell people mm. when they ask about my agency. I said, well, I don't want to, if I say good things about myself and my agency, it's bragging. Mm -hmm. So here there's 110 people. And if you just go to Google and mm -hmm. search my agency on there, um, you can find it. So I think people like re response time. I want to, yeah. I've always thought like I sell through servicing. Oh. And some people do it, they, they think of selling, you have to use these sales techniques. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things that one of the reasons that I, I connected with Jeffrey Gittimer and what he writes mm -hmm. about is that his tagline, his oldest tagline ever, what his tagline that's, that he's known for is people don't like to be sold, but they love to buy. Mm -hmm. Like nobody, like you guys don't wake up on a Saturday morning and say, let's drive out to Chantilly and have somebody sell us a car. Mm-hmm. What do you do? You go out, you look buy to buy a car. car, right? So people, people hate being sold to, but mm -hmm. they love to buy. Mm -hmm. So he just talks about that, that make it a memorable experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, it part of the, you know, getting referrals from other people, you get that. Now they'll say, ask for referrals mm -hmm. and we're going to get into sales philosophies and stuff here. But one of the things again, at my old company is that when you would sell them something. So if I'm, if I'm a copier salesman and I sell a copier to Joe's company and they'll say, well, at the end of your sales presentation, when you're about to hand him the copier is get the names of five mm -hmm. of his friends and family. And I just think that's the worst time mm -hmm. to ask. So the best time, the only time I'll ever say to somebody, Hey, I'm sure, you know, two or three other people that might be unhappy with their insurance. Mm -hmm. I'll do that after they've had an accident. And I've helped them through it oh, and, they, yeah. and they, and they thank me. They say, Oh, thank you so much for this. I always say, you know what? Like I'll say it tongue in cheek, but I'll say, you know what? Don't thank me. Don't tell me how great I am. I already know how great I am. Mm -hmm. that, you don't need to tell me, go tell Facebook and Google how great I am or mm -hmm. go, go tell your three neighbors how great I am. He said something once I shared this in one of my networking groups because it fit with that networking organization was that the worst time is right after you've sold them something. Mm -hmm. the second best time is after you've delivered and when you've helped them, he mm -hmm. said, but the best way to get a referral is to give a referral. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about that because in, in my industry, like mortgage people and realtors are very, very good sources of referrals to me mm -hmm. and like insurance agents, all we do, and I've done this before, all we do, we drop off coffee and donuts. Mm -hmm. Well, if you know anybody, send my way. Yeah. But there's a couple things I've been, I've been reading some other agents and marketing companies that are re to, with mortgage people is to find ways because there's certain mortgage people that might not be very tech savvy or this mm -hmm. and that, but these insurance agents, one down in Richmond is setting up, uh, marketing programs for the loan officers and spending a little money on it. And it's generating, it's filling the funnel to these mortgage people. So imagine like two insurance people are walking in the door to Samantha's mortgage company. And one guy has donuts and the other guy says, Hey, do you mind if I, if I, if, if, uh, automatically you get five emails a week of people that are interested in mortgages, like, and the only thing I ask is yeah. that in exchange, you just refer them back to me for the insurance part once yeah. they get a loan with you. I mean, as long as they're not the trashiest referrals or leads in the world, yeah. I mean, you're going to, you're going to throw those donuts in the trash. Yeah. I mean, who needs, you can, can buy your own donuts. True. That's interesting. Well, I was just thinking about that. Like, well, I was thinking about who the leads were, yada, yada. I was like going off on a, a little side binge. So personal branding, 
having that creative energy, that's that common thing, that creative energy propelled you to starting your own thing. So once you got self-employed, what is some takeaways from being that self-employed person? Oh, goodness. Um, the biggest thing I remember is having a little cash saved mm. because you go from, you know, large income to like no income. So mm-hmm. uh, being able to have and it was very helpful at the time that we were we didn't have kids. I mean, kids are expensive. Yeah, right? they are. God. Yeah, they are. I've never been more, I always say the most, the most wealthy I felt like I ever was, was when we were living in Pennsylvania in our little townhouse condo with like a $650 a month mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. And we were both working, both earning okay amount of money. God, I just had unlimited. I just had all this extra money. And now you got braces to think about. You're not kidding. (laughs) We do. As a matter of fact, we do. You're very on, on point right there. I know that because I have a child the same age and (sighs) I have an ortho consultation next week. But I mean, having, having your, getting your personal finances in order yeah. before you go off on your own is so if important. You, if you don't know how to do that, listeners, go back and listen to Amelia because she talks about getting your money sh- together. So it's true. It's yeah. a good breakdown of how to do that. Cause I think, you know, I know we're guilty of this. You think, you know, you don't have money, but, it, um, but if you're not simply paying your bills, if you have any, you know, spending beyond the bare, bare, bare minimum, there's, you know, yeah. probably ways you can cut some things or move some things around to kind of work. That's why, like where the goal setting comes in. It's like, okay, if you really want to do this, if that creative energy is burning that hole in you, you got to get some other things in order before you take the leap. Yeah. That's great. The other thing is the, what you spend money on in your company when you start it. Mm. And uh, some people just think it's very cookie cutter to think that if you're going to start a certain business, I'm trying to think of one other than insurance, but another business that yeah. you need to, like a restaurant, for instance, that mm-hmm. you have to advertise in. You have to do print advertising oh, yeah. or you have to advertise here or there. But if it's not making you money, people just think it's just, they say the cost of doing business. Mm-hmm. Well, the cost of doing business is, you know, needing to pay for your licensing or needing, yeah. if you're a restaurant, health department stuff mm-hmm. or getting the the frying, the fryer, the air system near yeah. the fryers serviced twice a year. That's a cost of doing business. Yeah. But astronomical rent, just because it's, you think like it's people will get on me. Like I'll see other people in my industry that have this big storefront retail location. And because I've looked at it before, I know how expensive it is, mm-hmm. but there's not, if you're spending 4,000 a month on rent, when a thousand dollars will do, especially now, with, like a restaurant needs a good location. They need yeah. visibility. But if you're an investment person or if you're selling copiers, yeah, nobody yeah. walks through a shopping center and sees a copier store and goes in and buys a big co- – I'm talking mm-hmm. the industrial office yeah. copiers. Yeah. Um, so goodness, I mean, as cheap as you can go on your rent Yeah. because it's just profit out the door. Um, and if you're going to have a big – if you're going to pay for better location mm-hmm. with rent, you better earn my, it should increase your revenues yeah. to make, make up for that. I was thinking of um, our local favorite that we mention a lot is Hector's. It's our local mm. Mexican restaurant. And I don't know if I've ever seen any advertising on their part, but they, their specialty, which we need to have Balta on the podcast, their specialty is welcoming everybody. Like everyone who walks through that door feels welcomed and it grows word of mouth and on Facebook, if people mention it and like if yeah. anyone says anything negative or something, I mean, the whole community comes on. And of course, they've never asked anyone to, no. oh, go defend us or go do this. I mean, not that they need defending from anything, yeah. but just it's amazing to see the fierce loyalty that people have. Yeah. And it's not because, you know, of ads, it's how they treat yeah. people. So oh, if I was a restaurant and I, it's funny because part, we were talking before we went on about the what you if you could do anything in the world, what would mm-hmm. you want to do? And I always, for me, it would be a, a chef Ooh, or a, a cook really? in a restaurant. Yeah. Oh, I love watching the, the Gordon Ramsay videos and stuff, Yeah. but I'm not talented. I mean, I'm okay. I can make steak very well. I can make mm-hmm. a restaurant quality steak, nice. but other than that, I can't really create stuff on my own. So I would need proper education, which mm-hmm. I don't have, but I've often, my big thing is uh, would be opening a restaurant that's mm-hmm. if i could do anything would be open wow. a restaurant now my wife amanda's family ran a restaurant for many years that she worked at so she it's like restaurant and divorce yeah or no restaurant and stay married yeah <laughs> so would probably, it will never ever yeah, happen but i have so many 
thoughts on restaurants. And you're right, like yeah. market uh, Yelp, Facebook marketing mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, and it's most of it is free. Yeah, I, I mean, or you can it. just give give them five dollars, give them a free dessert if they'll check in on Facebook and say something good. Yeah. That's where you hear about good restaurants. Yeah. Everyone When's the last time you read, open up a newspaper or a magazine and, yeah. oh, this restaurant looks good. We should go there. What do you do if, if you're you traveling? Google food. If, yeah. If you're, tra food. if you're traveling, if you're in, uh, if you're in Austin, Texas yeah. and you want to find the best place to get brisket, you're going to go to Yelp. Yeah. You're not going to go get the Austin Herald or whatever yeah. and see, and well, let me see paid who's advertising. Yeah. yeah. In some ways I've often felt that restaurants, if or I see a restaurant that's advertising all over the place, that almost mm -hmm. is a sign of inferiority yeah. in a way because yeah. you shouldn't need to really do that much mm -hmm. print advertising if you're in the food industry. Your yeah. customer should sell that. And I get jealous because it's so much easier. Restaurants would be so much more fun to market than a little insurance agency. Well, like it's so hard to make insurance fun. I get yeah. I get the most response on my Facebook and Instagram stuff mm -hmm. when, when I just I post photos of the kids. Yeah, like I'll post a little article about why you should have life insurance and this and Nothing. that. And I'll get crickets, like crickets. Three likes. My yeah. dad, Amanda, <laughs> and like somebody else. Yeah, like my my realtor or something. But then I'll post a picture like the other night on Facebook yeah. of uh, my of Jacob and he found my name badge, my the magnetic name yeah. badge that I wear sometimes. And he put it on. I took a cute picture of him. And I said, like, uh, click like if you would buy insurance from this Aww. guy. And it's like Boom. 80 people. Yeah. Yeah. So using your kids more. Yeah. Oh, a good, good tip. Good tip. If you've yeah, got kids. If you start a business, have kids right after that. Because you're going <laughs> to – that one year after you're done selling to your friends and family, you're going to need some extra marketing. Yeah. I think we talked about this at our lunch is that when I left the manager job at the company mm -hmm. and went back to be an agent for the company – when I started my own agency, I wasn't really that scared because mm -hmm. we had a little bit of money to live on and I knew how to do it. I would just, I felt like I had grown mm -hmm. intellectually and entrepreneurially. Yeah. But when I left the manager job to go back and sell that, if I was ever scared, that was the time I was scared because mm -hmm. I actually remember thinking then if it, that this might not work out, we might end up just moving back to Pennsylvania. Not that that was like a punitive thing, moving back yeah, to Pennsylvania, no, but because for the one year as a manager, I did. That was the one time I did have to experience the the work, the bad commuting because mm -hmm. I had to drive to all these offices, and I was just leaving the house at six thirty in the morning and getting home late. But we didn't have kids, mm -hmm. and it was like Amanda would eat on her own, or we would just eat at eight thirty, and mm -hmm. like life didn't. It was more flexible back then. Um, but that would have been when I was scared because we didn't know anybody. Yeah, I went back to be this salesperson in this office. And you, you should not rely exclusively on people you know. You got to get out and meet other yeah. people. But I knew nobody mm -hmm. in two, 2008 when I went back to be an agent. We had like three friends, yeah, that we had just met through our neighborhood, and that was it. Yeah. So what? So that's really interesting because so many people, like you said, you can't build a business on family and friends, and I think that that's one of those false senses of security is when people do mm -hmm. have that. So what gave you the push you needed? Like to feel the fear and do it anyway. To leave the manager job, mm -hmm. I hated it that much. It was the, oh it was, my goodness, it, it was, was the most miserable year of my life. Yeah, most miserable year of my life was two thousand seven, mm. for for a lot of reasons. But I, yeah. it it was just it was brutal. It they I had more freedom as a salesperson for that company than I did as a manager. For sure, yeah. part of the reason was and he he won't hear this podcast, so I I won't say I'm not gonna say a name, but the manager that hired me to move to Virginia, yeah. He had just gotten promoted. He was my boss. Mm -hmm. He got promoted from the job I got. Okay. So all these people that were now reporting to me used to report to him. Mm -hmm. And he just told me how to do everything. And it had to be that way. And, yeah. and it was uh, it was a bad year. Yeah. It was, man, talk about 2007. I mean, yeah. it was great moving to Virginia, but we didn't really start to experience life here until yeah. I went on my own. And yeah. it just keeps getting better and better. Like That's wine. But first year in Virginia. Not so good. Horrible. Well, so they say, um, is it something like the pain of staying where you are has to be worse than the pain of change? Because change is always painful. Like it's always, yeah. it's always different, the fear of it, but, but I, staying the same has to outweigh yeah. that. But when I, well, I hated that manager job so much and went back to be a salesperson at that same time, I was looking for other jobs mm. because I remember I was Googling anything. Yeah. 
And I have, remember I had like a recruiter headhunter guy out in Tyson's corner that was kind of working with me. And I, I was, it just made me feel better to know that there were other options that he was mm-hmm. looking for other stuff. Yeah. But when I started my own, my own gig, certainly I wasn't looking for. Other yeah. Jobs. No, not at all. So Tom, oh if goodness. someone wants to make the change, wants to go out on their own, wants to do more within the position they're in or pursue a dream, what would be your like advice to run with it? Well, the only not caution, but the only caution thing to think about would be, what are you not able to do? Because working for a company is not, I mean, eventually I'm going to hire a salesperson yeah. in my office. I don't want to completely rip and that person oh, yeah. will technically be working for a company. But oh, yeah. what, what are you not getting where you're at now? What are they, where, what are your restrictions? I mean, it, because most companies, if you're one of the top producers, you'll, you know, people say I'm leaving for money. Mm-hmm. I mean, the top sales producers at most companies, matter of fact, may are in the, probably in the top, 20 mm-hmm. look think of a big company large insurance mm-hmm. company yeah the top 25 high, most highly compensated people in that company i bet you there's salespeople in there yeah oh I mean, yeah certainly totally. as board members and yeah. chairmen and this and that but i guarantee there's some salespeople in there i'm glad you brought that up because i had a conversation with a friend who um is kind of my go-to entrepreneurial like just go getter friend i think of this person like that in the middle of a conversation seeking advice about starting my own business, it dawned on me that this person works for a company. And I said, wait a second, you're pumping me up. You're giving me all this great advice. Why do you work for a company? And they were saying how like they have figured out what they need from a job and what kind of employer. And so they enjoy the benefits of working for an employer. So they make yeah. sure to have a job with flexibility. They have the income level that they want, but they don't have to assume the risk because they've been there, done that. And they might do it again, but right now, and that was such a great, like for me, aha moment that like, oh, because I feel like, especially when you come from the direct sales world, especially when you run with entrepreneurs, I think you get into this mindset where it's like, F the man, be your own boss. Right. You know, the American dream is starting your own business. Is it though? Yeah. Because it's a lot of work. It's funny you mention that because one of the top producing sales reps at the company that I worked for before, the number one guy at the time, he was number one guy in Virginia. He would, and he would admit this, he would be a total failure if he went mm-hmm. on his own. He, there, mm-hmm. all the things that he gets from that company that just being able to laser, I mean, he is the classic old school salesperson. Yeah. Um, and he just, he's, he's the hand me a list of a hundred people and I'll sit here and call them all night and I'll probably mm-hmm. sell to two people. And that's a successful night, yeah. even though 98% of the people like want to call the cops on you for harassment, <laughs> yeah. but he would sell to two people and that was a good night. Yeah. So he needs to stay at that company yeah. because, and he, it's like the, the things I miss about working for a company, mm-hmm. I do miss the recognition stuff. Mm-hmm. There was, tr- and a, trust me, Amanda misses the, the annual the sales conference. Yes. Uh, oh my goodness. We went on some, some very nice trips. Yeah. Uh, and the, I mean, I, you Paid know, sick leave. Uh, I mean, just there's yeah. certain perks where I just feel like and I like to, so when I'm have in conversations with friends that work for an employee and if, if it starts bashing the company and things like that, I feel like I either bite my tongue or I do try to slip in stuff like, well, when you're the owner, you assume all this risk. And so it's kind of, you know, it's high risk, high reward. Yeah. And so, you know, when you're off the clock, you're totally off the clock. But when you're an entrepreneur, you're always thinking about it. And so that's why if you're going to do your own thing, it's like you have to, it's all this cliche advice that yeah. just the older you get, you're like, oh yeah, you have to be passionate about it in some way or another. And so for some like you, yeah, you might not be, you know, the, the joy of insurance, the excitement of it, but <laughs> I think for you though, it's helping you, you know, you're able to help your clients and help your family. So it kind of ties in with who you are as a person yeah. that you want to service them. You want to have quick, quick response time, you know, those things. So like there's aspects of the yeah. business that fit. Yeah. I don't remember yeah. what it was like to be able to shut things off, mm-hmm. but it's good. I mean, like I said before, we don't like, I don't check my phone while we're eating dinner. Yeah. Um, but most nights I'm doing stuff from eight to nine little mm-hmm. catch up stuff. Um, and I guess working, see, working for a company, I was kind of doing that a mm-hmm. little bit as well. Anytime you're in a sales type job yeah. where you have some level of ownership, you're, you're kind of always 
checking things a little bit, yeah. but, um, but I do miss, yeah, I miss being able to shut it off if I had to. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the recognition stuff working for the company, yeah. you'd win something or you'd hit some goal or something and everyone was rah, rah on you. And now like nobody gives a crap. Yep. Like, <laughs> That's why you need like, your entrepreneur friends though, that, yeah. that rally around yeah. you and. Yeah, but even that, you. nobody really announces it, though. You don't announce it for yourself. You know, like, I set a record this month that I made the most sales or I grew <laughs> the most. And, Look, Jeremy, right, I'll thank give you, you a Jeremy. standing ovation from Jeremy, <laughs> slow clapping it up. No, I'm glad, we, I'm glad we wrapped it up with that because I love motivation and you read all these books and watch the videos and do all the rah, rah, go, go, go stuff. But for me personally, you know, with when my kids were born, I wanted to stay home with them. And I thought I was going to do it all. I thought I was going to be like the successful businesswoman, but still a stay at home mom and da, da, da. And then Riley was born and she cried all the time and I didn't set up <laughs> childcare. And so it became harder to figure out what I was going to do. And, and then I just realized like, oh, I, I kind of, I don't want to work. Like, and I, and we were, I was blessed that thankful that we were able to have me stay home and. I just, I felt guilty for a long time. Like a lot of years I beat myself up and I think I still even get into that trap where I, you know, my tape's playing where, you know, I'm a failure because I couldn't do this and that and whatnot. And I had to just kind of reframe my mind that, you know, there's a, that motivation and hustling and all that stuff is good, but that's not the point of life. Like, what are we honestly living for? Hmm. And does it meet your life goals and not just the money goals, but, you know, I mean, for me, it would be like your faith goals or your just what's the point of life type of thing. And I don't know. I think I just got wrapped up in just looking only at the successes. What is success? And if if you look at it in purely a business world or hustling or making your own, you know, I just feel like you you can, you get bombarded with those messages that. Oh, the good, this probably ties into what you and Amelia talked about as well. If you, if you live well below your means that you don't, you don't have to define success by how much money you make. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can define the success by how many people you've helped mm-hmm. or, I mean, I'm much more happy to read when I get like a Google review or a Facebook review with, that's yeah. positive. I mean, I like that because it's hopefully others will see it and it'll yeah. generate more referrals and more, yeah. more phone calls and stuff. But um yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't get jazzed up. Like to see a, a commission check come in. Yeah. It nearly as, it's so weird to say this, nearly as much as uh, Joe G just left you a review on Google. Really? Really? I'm like, oh, I, I, I want to oh. see that. I want to read this. <laughs> and then you're like, yeah, yeah. that's because that's your form of recognition. Yeah. That's your only like, yay. I'm waiting prizes. for a one star. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Haven't gotten any yet. And I have custom- a few people that don't care for me that I've had experiences with, but um, yeah. I haven't had any, gosh, I, it's one of the bad, if I had did run a restaurant, cause restaurants have yeah. it tough cause they'll get bad reviews. Yeah. I told a fr- friends of mine that run a restaurant, I gave them advice. I'd never sent them a bill for this advice either, but. Oh, um, so kind of you. Right. <laughs> so have, kind. Should have Tom's consulting LLC, <laughs> uh, is that they were getting the one star review, a couple one star reviews and they're, they're going to defend each one of them saying mm-hmm. that this person doesn't know what they're talking about and this and that. So they put up a, a sign. And so what you have to do is you have to drown out the one star with more five stars. Yeah. So get more five stars in there. And they put on their chalkboard when you walk in, it's still there. As if you had a great experience, uh, you know, please shout about us on Yelp and Facebook. And they said, if your experience wasn't up to par, I said, put your personal cell phone number on there. I said, no one's going to call you as a, you know, but, um, they're one star. Well, they've get for that result of that, they got more five stars are yeah. getting more reviews. Um, Great. They tip. still get some one stars, I'm sure. Yeah, but but you're always, you're um, never going to make yeah. everyone happy. I mean, yeah. but like you said, you have to drown out and that's great life advice for us. It's like, you have to drown out the negativity with yeah. so much positivity so that yeah. you, you can't hear that negativity. It, it, a whole other podcast on how to deal with one star reviews. Oh, good. I'm so lucky because I've never gotten yeah. one yet. Yeah. I'm almost hoping for one own it that yeah i think you have to own it well yeah like yes it, but, there, but that's there for is, another day that's another day there are two ways to handle one star reviews okay. and most people do the wrong totally the wrong thing. are you going to make it a teaser or are you going to share it before we say goodbye oh we can talk about it well we'll talk about oh. it on the after show we'll talk about it on the after show tom thank you so much for coming if people want to continue a conversation with you how can they find you www.bigoski.com or just Google Bigoski. 
So I'm the only, I'm in a small family and I'm the only one that's apparently online. So you might nice. see some of my brother's stuff if you Google Bogoski, but uh, if you just Google Bogoski, it'll start pulling my stuff up. All right. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. My pleasure. That's a wrap for now. Thanks for listening to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. Music provided by twinmusicom.org. Song titled Night at the Dance Hall. Sound editing by me, Jeremy Spittle. A special thanks to our studio sponsor, M&M Exteriors. Visit their website at mmexteriors.com for all of your roofing, siding, and gutter needs in the Northern Virginia area. Visit our website at flushingitout.com and be sure to subscribe. This has been a Spitfire production. That was the greatest thing I've ever heard. Don't forget to check out the after show on the Full Flush bonus episode where Samantha and I continue the conversation with our guest. You can find the Full Flush episode right here on Flushing It Out every Friday.